You're watching our continuous coverage here from Davos 2022. I'm Shireen Barnett. It gives me great pleasure to bring on to the program Her Excellency Mariam al the Minister for Climate Change at the UAE. Thank you very much, Her Excellency, for joining us here on CNBC TV 18. Uh, you know, climate, food security, these are issues that you're passionate about and these are issues that are top of the agenda here at Davos 2022. How concerned are you about the current events having an impact or setting some of these goals and agendas back. Thank you so much, Shireen. Thank you for having me. Yes, we're here in beautiful Davos, and I think it's a very timely meeting because, uh, as you said, climate, food security, it's all interlinked together, and it is uh, of utmost importance that we convene and we discuss uh, because there is urgent tasks that we have to do. Um, our food systems were already very weak, uh, COVID hit, they were weakened even more. Uh, the conflict uh, of Russia and Ukraine is uh, threatening our food systems even more. So it's really important that we talk about what are the solutions, how we can work together. Um, I am concerned, yes. Uh, in the short term, though, you talked about some of the challenges that we are faced with, and especially in light of what's happening with Russia and Ukraine, and that's only exacerbated the yes. current food uh, problem and the current food challenge. But what could be the solutions in the short term? Very important is that technology and innovation is leveraged as much as we can. Um, we, uh, at COP26, with the United States of America, we uh, launched um, AIM for Climate, which is the Agriculture Innovation Mission for Climate. This is all about how to get countries to commit in investing in climate-resilient agricultural systems. What's really important, Shireen, is that we need to transform our food systems into not just sustainable food systems, which was something I was always talking about, but now we need to talk about resilient, equitable and sustainable food systems. Mm -hmm. And um, aim for c was all about getting commitments from countries to invest more in R&D because we need to accelerate our efforts. Um, we've seen really good progress. Uh, we've had 170 um, uh, government and non-government actors come on board. Uh, so far, we have about four billion U.S. dollars in commitments, uh, and we hope by COP27 we'll be announcing uh, new targets as well and, and actual initiatives that people will see on the ground. What's really important about aim for c is that it really looks at a spectrum of things, so smallholder farmers, how we can help them, all the way up to novel technologies which we need because, as you know, by 2050, we're going to have to make 50% more food than we're making today and we already have such challenges today. So it's so important that we invest more in our food systems knowing also that the food systems contribute to a third of greenhouse gas emissions. So there's the climate link as well. So food systems are a problem, but they're also a solution as well. Mm -hmm. You talked about some of the solutions and the fact that it will require a significant amount of funding, and some of that has now been committed. Uh, but given the disruptions that we are currently yes. seeing and while all of this starts to play itself out, what could be, or do you believe that, the, you know, in the short term, we're just going to have to live with the current pain? No, I think there's, you know, I, I say in a way, we're all to blame in one way or another for what's happening right now. And so it's really important that everyone has to take this seriously. Everyone has to put their efforts down and everyone has to make this a priority. We need to fix the food systems and it's everybody's business. And it's really important we leverage uh, technologies, as I mentioned, that we foster partnerships. We really look at uh, public-private sector partnerships as well. Uh, the UAE government, for example, is partnering with the WEF, um, and we're going to be announcing some initiatives in the coming days as well. Um, all this is really to foster how we can work together, share knowledge, and really push forward in what policies we need to do, what changes we need to do on a national and global level. The UAE is very much about uh, um, making sure we're, we're, we're talking amongst our other um, say world citizens mm. when we talk about global challenges and looking at global solutions for that as well. Um, I think it's really important now that countries really refrain from um, export restrictions. Um, we really need to enable the flow of food, uh, especially to the vulnerable. Uh, so it's really important that countries um, discuss what could be done to uh, ensure that food is available and food is flowing. 
um, the conflict, uh, the Russia-Ukraine conflict, if you think about it, they are, they are actually supplying the world with food, fuel and fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is having a domino effect. So if farmers are to give certain basic commodities to other countries, they don't have the inputs, which is, for example, the fertilizer. Right. So, so it's, a, it's, it's a huge task that we have to do, and we need all hands on deck, and it is everyone's responsibility. It is everyone's responsibility, and linked to food security, of course, is the issue of climate security, and that is something that uh, you're spearheading uh, for the UAE. And I think I remember, uh, was it at COP26 post that, uh, that you said that uh, climate security needs to be at the top of the agenda, and climate change is experienced almost as a form of violence. But do you believe, given the current situation, we're going to see an acceleration towards climate security, the transition towards renewable energy, as Europe finds itself constrained, uh, energy constrained, on account of what's happening with uh, Russia and Ukraine? Do you think it'll push the needle, or do you think it'll actually hold back? We're going to see this in the next coming weeks. Um, there's a lot of changes happening um, because of the conflict. Uh, that certain countries are now choosing to maybe go for certain energy sources that they actually didn't want to go to anymore. Um, what we have to always think about is that we need a, a just transformation and we need to be practical, we need to be uh, pragmatic about this transition because everyone is at a different level, everybody has different resources and everybody has different even if you're talking about technologies, you have to also think of the capacity that's mm -hmm. needed to be able to deploy the technologies or use the technologies. And not forgetting that in order to actually build the infrastructure you need for uh, renewable energy, you need fuel and you need know-how for that too. So it's everything is um, linked together in a way that you can't just switch something off yeah. and on you have to have this this uh, this transformation you have to have the technology transfer you have to have the, the capacity building and we have to help each other as well in this look at our journey uh, it's been 16 years now since we decided we want to invest in solar energy for example and it's been a a good 16 years and we are now operating the three largest in capacity lowest in cost solar parks in the world but it's taken this time to do it and this is, we've set targets for ourselves by 2050. We want to be 50% uh, um, for our energy sources to be from clean and renewable energy because this is the pace that we feel is realistic for us to go about. We will supply the world with oil and gas as needed, but we will also take the responsibility of decarbonizing that as much as possible. So I think it's a two pronged approach. You need to ramp up your renewables while decarbonizing. Uh, the, the current existing uh, oil and gas sectors. And one of the recent things, for example, is Adnoc, um, our national oil company, since the 1st of January, is running completely on clean and renewable energy now uh, to operate its facilities. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a, a step we've taken because we believe this is the right thing to do. Plus also all the investments we're doing outside of the UAE to help other countries. We've invested so far uh, $16.8 billion in 70 different countries to help them on the renewable energy transition. Um, and there's so much more in the pipeline, but it's really, it's, it's making a plan for yourself mm -hmm. as to what's realistic while also helping others um, in what you have. And it's, it's not as easy as again switching the the button you no know, i i think you make a very valid point there and i think india faces this challenge as well when people talk about why don't you just give up on coal and you know move completely yeah. to yeah. uh to renewable uh you're right in pointing out that you need to be practical pragmatic and realistic about what can be achieved and the timelines yes. within yes. which to achieve that you talked about collaborating and partnering with different countries and i wanted to talk to you about yeah. uh the plans for india uh, we do also have a significant uh renewable transition roadmap yes. that's been laid out and of course the government is now focusing on things like green hydrogen etc right. uh, you know that's what right. do you see as the future between uh, the two so first of all we have a great relationship with India um, India when when I look at food for example it's uh, the number one trading partner for us when it comes to food and if I get to talk first about the food system side so we've launched the food tech valley and this is basically your 
kind of Silicon Valley idea. So it's a playground where we want to invite um, companies, scientists, innovators to come and really look at how to innovate in growing foods in hot, arid climates like the UAE. Um, this is where we'd love to see more companies uh, from, from India come on board and use also the, the kind of market access that the UAE has built through the, uh, the excellent infrastructure of, of logistics. Um, we also launched the Food Tech Challenge. Um, this is the second edition, uh, which we just launched about two months ago. And this is all about, again, harnessing innovation, accelerating um, startups to really think of, okay, do you have an innovation in reducing food loss and food waste? Do you have an innovation in producing clean food products? If you do, come on board because we will incubate you, we will mentor you, and we will. We have a pooled prize of $2 million that the winners are going to receive. So we'd love to see uh, some Indian startups come and, and apply. Uh, because it's it's ongoing right now, the application. Well, uh, you know, a lot of Indian startups are already looking at the Web3 space, uh, <laughs> that's and, and that's that's yeah. clearly heating up, and, and, and uh, it's a concerted a, a attempt to yes. sort of make uh, UAE the hub for, for Web3. You know, uh, Shireen, in our uh, national food security strategy, the vision is to become a hub for innovation-driven food security. That's the whole idea we have, so that by 2051 we become number one country for global food, on the Global Food Security Index. And the whole idea is really to, to build this, this mindset of innovation and technology, because we've seen in the last years that when you start harnessing the power of technology, I mean, we're growing blueberries, uh, raspberries, strawberries in the middle of the desert. We're growing sea bass and sea bream in the UAE and this was all not possible before but because of technology we're able now to recirculate the water in a closed system which really helps to reduce the use of natural resources and then thinking of the um, the low energy cost that, that we have it just becomes feasible it becomes commercially viable to produce certain food items in the UAE using technology so we wanted to bring that momentum and really, uh, I mean, India has so many startup companies that are really, really, uh, you know, gaining momentum as well. And we'd love to see them come on board and uh, have a win-win situation where they use the, the UAE as a hub of innovation for, for, for technologies. Because we are known as a hub for food trade, but we'd like to also be known as a hub for um, innovation and technology. And it's especially needed now. We, we cannot fix the food systems problem and world global hunger if we don't fix our food systems so that we need innovation and technology to do that. Yes, and, and the hope is that we can do this faster yes, uh, give, yeah. given the crisis that we're faced with at this point in time. But I want to ask you, uh, you know, how you decided to make your passion your work. I mean, you, you've been always passionate about the environment and, and you were scuba diving and had nothing to do with government. And then suddenly you find yourself uh, first as the Minister of State for Food and Water Security and now as the Minister for climate change. How did this come about? Well, God works in mysterious ways, you can see. I can only say it's really everything that, I, that I've done has been driven by passion. So I did scuba diving because I wanted to discover what's happening under the sea. And then I started seeing things, the corals that were alive, the fish that were alive, and then I saw things the pollution that we were putting in the sea and what it was doing to that. That got me angry and I said I need to do something. So I started looking even more and then I went to the Abu Dhabi Sustainability Conference, the, fam the famous um, uh, event we have every year. And I went there and I saw a former Minister of Environment and Water and had a chit chat with him about the idea of having a marine research vessel. And from that conversation, he's like, why don't you come on board into the government? And here I am today. So it's been a wonderful few years without a plan going into the government, but somehow with the passion that I had. Uh, and I'm very honored to be in the space I am now because these are the hot topics right now. Food security, climate, uh, environmental protection, biodiversity loss. It's all within my, my ministry. So we have a lot to do. 
um, but I always believe that if you have the passion in your heart, you can move forward. Yes, and you've managed to converge your passion with your yes. purpose, so hopefully it'll be far more effective. But you, you know, you're going to be speaking with leaders here at the World yes, Economic Forum, and as you've said, these are issues top of mind, uh, food security, climate risks. Um, but given the various challenges the world is going through and the turbulence currently that the world is going through, uh, do you fear that there is perhaps going to be some amount of a pullback from these issues, both in terms of funding as well as in terms of political will and capital? It's really important that we continue the momentum that we had at COP26. So COP26 saw leaders actually committing to their net zero. And as you know, the UAE also has a net zero by 2050 strategic uh, initiative. So it's being here and having these conversations that it's really important that we keep reminding each other the importance of this agenda, the importance of how this is so linked to human needs, the basic human needs, and how this is so linked to our lives. And that it's so important that we keep that in front of our eyes, keep that in front of the journey that we're doing, and that we make sure that the climate agenda is priority in every government's agenda, because the climate agenda is connected to the energy, it's connected to the food, it's connected to the air we breathe, it's connected to the basics of, of living. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that we're putting the numbers out there, we're reminding everyone we need more ambitious targets, we need more ambitious NDCs, and the UAE is also currently working on a more um, ambitious agenda for that. And we really hope that because we're hosting COP28 uh, in, in the UAE in 2023, that we hopefully continue the momentum of, of Glasgow to Sharm el Sheikh and to uh, the, the UAE to actually push forward actions, solutions to accelerate and make sure that we don't exceed the 1.5 degrees Celsius. Well, we certainly hope that we don't. Yes. Uh, you know, you, you talked to me about the 2050 plan uh, that you have in place and you're working towards yes. that. But let me ask you about more immediate yes. uh, targets yes. and more immediate priorities. Over the next five years, for yes. instance, what yeah. do you hope that you will have so, achieved? Uh, the UAE has put uh, in our NDCs, we've put a reduction of 23.5 percent. Um, but we're now working on more ambitious targets, uh, which we'll hopefully announce before COP27. Um, and it's just also reminding the region, other countries around us, and also globally, that everyone has a uh, responsibility to put more ambitious targets in this. It's not an easy task, and that's why it's really important that we convene in events like here uh, to actually talk about it and see how we can build partnerships to help each other. Um, and uh, it's, it's really important that while we do the net zero by 2050 initiative, I mean, us as the UAE, I cannot speak for other countries, but we are looking on a detailed roadmap, mm -hmm. and uh, we hope that by COP27, we'll be announcing all our interim targets. So it's not just a far away target, but we're actually seeing where we want to be in 2030, 2035, 2040, and looking at the priority sectors. So it's not just one one target, but looking at priority sectors such as the cement sector, the waste sector, the energy sector, and where each sector has to be. Because each of these sectors have a heavy weight mm -hmm. on the uh, g greenhouse gas emissions, so we need to look at each one of them and prioritize them. Well, we wish you the very best of luck, Your Excellency. Thanks Thank very you. much for speaking to us here on CNBC TV 18. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. Well, Thank we you. will take a break here, but the conversations continue at Davos 2022. We're back in a moment after this short break with a lot more.